everyone and welcome to Java Basics. Last time we created a simple Wordle game. In this video, we'll improve it with files and IO. This is the code from the last video, which is our starting point. You can download it from there. It also, it's also in the video description, so no need to copy it from here. Here you can find the code after the changes we do today. This too is in the video description. Unlike the previous link, this link includes the full project directory since we're dealing with more than one file. In the previous video, a big problem in the game was the dictionary. We wrote the list of words, but only supported five. There are close to 13,000 valid words. We can add them to the code, but it would be unpleasant. Ideally, we would want to read the list from somewhere, a file. To read files, we need to understand the concept of IO. We already touched it a bit when using the scanner class to read the text that you typed. Computer programs take input in the form of data and produce output. But typically, when we talk about IO, we refer to files and network. One of the big things about IO operations is that they fail often. A network might be unavailable, a file might be missing, a disk might be out of space. When we read or write information, we should prepare for failure. So how can we handle such a failure in a consistent way? A common way in all programming languages was to return zero for success and any other value to indicate failure. This seems like a good idea in theory until you try to use it. As you can see, we have more error handling code than code that performs the operations. If we forget to check a return value, it might create a serious problem down the road. This is potentially dangerous. It's inconvenient to mix our error handling code with our application logic. Worse, if we write code to handle file processing, that code might run for a command line tool or a web application. The error handling code would be very different in both situations. I would like someone else to handle that. This gets even worse. I skipped the actual error handling code in the previous example, but it needs to do multiple things. One of those things is cleanup. We can't leave a bad file open. This will drain resources from the system, so we need to close the file, as you can see here. Unfortunately, closing a file can fail too. This is something we don't check or report in this code. There has to be a better way. Luckily, Java has that better way, exception handling. We can use the return value of the method to return information like size and ignore the error. If the error is caught, it can be handled in the catch block. Initially, this doesn't seem like a huge difference. We just moved the error handling code to a new location. This is the IO code from before. Notice we don't do any error handling. If there's an error, it will be thrown and we can handle it in a different location in the code. We can mostly ignore it while coding. Here's where this gets interesting. One of the big problems in handling errors manually is that developers might forget to handle errors. Java has two exception types, checked, which is the default, and runtime exceptions. Checked exceptions must be caught or must be declared using a throws statement on the method. That means you won't be able to compile your application without handling the checked exception. This is a feature that is unique to Java. Some developers don't like it. I love it. Exception handling in Java has a few more tricks up its sleeve. Notice we open the file reading code within the try call at the top. This is called try with resources, and it means 
we don't need to close the file. The try block will do the cleanup for us and make sure the file is closed properly. We don't even need a catch block. We can use the try statement just to close the file and let the exception propagate to the next catch block. There's more to discuss about exceptions, but for now, let's put this on hold and read a file. We continue where we left off. We right click the root directory of the project, not the source directory. We select new file in the context menu and create a new text file called words.txt. Here we will paste the list of words I copied off the web. You can see the URL for the word list in the comment section for this video. We then hit Command S or Control S to save the file. Next, we go to the main class. The dictionary is a final array, which means we can't resize it. We'll replace it with a list, which is, which is an object in Java we can resize. Notice that list is a generic interface. That means it has a type associated with it. Strings in this case. We will discuss interfaces and generics soon enough. We assign an array list to the list interface. And in Java, we can't create instances of interfaces, but classes can implement these interfaces. Array list is an implementation of the list interface. Again, this is syntax that's a bit obtuse at this stage. We'll discuss it later. Notice that there's more than one list class in Java. We need to import the right one using alt, the alt enter shortcut. Make sure you import java.util.list and not a different class or things won't work. Once we do that, the code will work. Let's start implementing what we learned about file IO. We will start with a try with resources block for a buffered reader. This class lets us read a text file line by line. Java has two basic types of streams. The first are readers and writers, which work best with text files. The second group is input streams and output streams which are built for binary files like images. A buffered reader is a wrapper class. It wraps another reader, which does the actual work of reading from the file. This is similar to the scanner class we used before. In this case, we'll use the file reader to read from the file and give it the name of the text file we just created. Notice that the compiler complains about this. That's because we didn't catch the exception. Once we do that, the error goes away. It's important to always log an error. Otherwise, you might accidentally swallow an exception. And then when you try to understand what's going on, you won't have a clue. We can use print stack trace, which prints the error and the stack that leads to the error then return to exit the application. This isn't ideal, but for now, it's fine. We can now read the first line of text from the file. Obviously, this isn't enough, so we add a loop. When the file ends, uh, we will receive a null value, which means we'll stop the loop. We then use the add method of the list to add the current line and read the next line. Again, if the next line is null, then the loop will stop. The last thing we need to do is convert the text to uppercase, so the rest of the code will work seamlessly. With that, we're finished. We can run the project and start typing in words, and this will work like the real Wordle. It will only accept dictionary words but it will verify them against that huge list of words. Everything we wrote before works seamlessly with no code changes. Notice that this isn't as seamless for all cases, but it is in this case. This code is fine. 
But reading a file with many lines isn't something unique that we do once in a while. It's a common operation. Java includes the Files API, which lets you do all sorts of things like this. Reading a file to a string or a byte array or a list of strings separated by lines as we do here. This operation accepts a path object, which has a bit of an obtuse syntax as we need to create a file reference object and get the path from there. In this case, instead of catching the IO exception, I'll just declare that the main method throws that exception. This works even for the main method. This seems like it will work, but this code will fail. Pause the video and think for a second. What's missing? Can you spot it? The content will be lowercase since the file is all lowercase. Ideally, I would fix the file just uh, or just change the code to use lowercase. But I can also process the entire list using a stream. Streams let us process a set of data. Don't confuse them with IO streams. They aren't directly related. They can process data similarly uh, to a for loop, but the syntax is something more elegant and powerful. In streams, we chain methods to one another to perform a series of operations on the data. We can use methods to sort the data, remove duplicates, etc. In this case, the map method converts every entry in the stream to a new entry. In this case, we use the method reference syntax, which is uh, unique. What the syntax says is that we should invoke the two uppercase method of every string in the stream and return the result. The stream will pass all the strings to the map method and it will result in uppercase versions of the strings. Finally, we convert the stream back to a list and replace the existing list with the newly created list where all the strings are uppercase. Running the project, we can see that this works as we expect, which leaves us with one final change to perform. We no longer need the isInDictionary method. The list interface includes a contains method that we can use instead. Once we do that, we can also remove the isInDictionary method, which means we both support the full dictionary and we did it with fewer lines of code than before. We covered many big topics in today's video. I hope you found it helpful. In the next video, we'll start keeping track of our runs and start discussing object-oriented principles. If you have any questions, please use the comment section. Thank you.